To me, dungeons have always felt like the lifeblood of the Legend of Zelda series. It's the only part of Breath of the Wild that I thought was truly lacking when it comes down to it. Other pieces of the game had some stuff missing, but dungeons were a disappointment. Dungeons being my favourite part of Zelda games makes sense though, since this game is my favourite of them all. Twilight Princess has some of the single best dungeons in the series. I think three of my top five all come from this game. So let's pick up right where we left off as we begin with the first few dungeons in the game. Last time we went through the entire beginning of this game, all the way up to the Spirit of Light, leaving the hero of Twilight with his journey. His goal, to free the land of Hyrule from the ruling of the usurper King Zan. With this, he sets out to the only temple in the entirety of the Farren Woods, the Forest Temple. In this episode, I won't go into the story quite as much until maybe the end, because the dungeons are so intricately designed and could be talked about at length, and this full retrospective series is already going to be well over an hour, so I'll just talk about the stuff that I need to, since there is a lot to unpack in the first three areas of the game. Before I start the video fully though, please do be sure to subscribe as I'll be doing this series monthly until around January time, and I hope you enjoy. And sorry about my voice today, it's my birthday this week and I was doing a lot of shouting at football players this week. <laughs> The Forest Temple seems like it's pretty unfavoured when compared to the rest of the dungeons in Twilight Princess. I see a whole ton of people that complain about the monkeys making this dungeon one of the most linear affairs in the game. Some people take issue with the theme itself, or just see it as bad. Let me be straightforward with you guys right now, this is my pick for the worst dungeon in this game. Saying that, I don't think that it's objectively horrible, and I don't think it's anywhere near the worst in the series. So, let's start with the good. Atmospherically, this area is no slouch. I think that all of the music in the Farron section of this game are amazing, and this carries on that trend. While this track isn't quite as catchy as the other ones, it does well to set the tone, especially for what is the tutorial dungeon. The enemies in here are also really well selected. Instead of starting the game up, getting into the first temple, and instantly going up against threats like the Dark Nuts and other humanoid creatures, you're mostly going up against wildlife and bugs. Heck, the only sort of humanoid creature you actually go up against is a baboon, furthering that point. The scariest thing you go up against in the entire zone is a few big sculptures. I also think some of the puzzles are pretty cool, but leave something to be desired down to the ease of them. And yeah, that's about where my criticism begins. It's very handholdy, usually showing you the exact location that you always need to go. The main goal of the temple is to find monkeys too. I haven't had this happen to me before, but I'd imagine missing one of those monkeys would be dreadful, since you'd have to run all the way around the temple again, and like I said, the dungeon itself is a little too easy, so that would just be annoying. And it's a theme that we've seen a few times now, and I think it was done much better in older games. As a quick example, the Forest Temple in Ocarina of Time was better than this. I'd go as far as to say this was one of the worst to rock this theme. With the knowledge that this is the opening dungeon though, it's not too surprising. The first of all of them is usually the most simplistic in each Zelda game, since it's showing new players how the game functions. So yeah, it has that on its side I guess. One thing that this dungeon does really well in my opinion is introducing a character and instantly showing the difference in their character when they're not being possessed by some kind of evil. Ook the Baboon won't be winning any character nominees at this year's Game Awards, but they are a cool character anyway. They're the leader of the monkeys being possessed by a parasitic might. After having that cut off in the mini boss fight of the dungeon by the hero, and with him giving Link a really cool item. Seriously, the Gale Boomerang is a new take on an old item, which is something this game does really right as you'll see as this series goes on. The boss of the Forest Temple is okay. It's basically a giant couple of Daku Babas named Daya Baba, and it uses the new item pretty well and has some cool themes and is really epic in scale. But the coolest thing this fight does is reintroduce Ook the Baboon and have him help you take down the plague on the temple. With an assist from Ook, Link restores the peace in Farron Woods. At least for now, anyway. After dealing with Diababa and collecting the first of three few shadow pieces, Link and Midna make their way out and go on over to Hyrule Field. Now I won't stay on this long since I might do another video in the future on the side content in this game since I've been going through the game on stream recently, but Hyrule Field in this game gets quite a lot of flack I think. It's not the most dense area in the franchise, but it adds to the scope of the game and increases the epic factor tenfold, which, you know, feels like it had a very large part to play in the design process all the way down to the graphics. Nevertheless, Midna and Link make their way to Kakariko Village, where Colin, Tallow, Mallow and Beth have all been spotted. Here is where Link has to once again turn into a wolf, and I will likely always stand by the fact that these are some of the worst sections in the game, so much so that I didn't really want to talk about them. 
Sometimes they do some clever things, but it just feels tedious at times in my opinion. The cool thing about this wolf section is that it doesn't just revolve around some pretty boring gameplay and some exploration that can be fun in a way. It actually plays into the story in a really weird way. There's this moment where you're in a building full of bombs and it blows up as you're trying to find the tears of light which interrupts production of bombs for a small section of the game. A small thing but it tries to show us that this world is actually lived in which is very appreciated. After saying hello to the children of Ordon once again, Link makes his way back to Ordon village to tell the chief of Ordon that he needs something from him as teased by Renardo. After a tense wrestling match between the pair, the chief entrusts the secret weapon for defeating the Gorons in their own wrestling game. With these new items, the iron boots, Link makes his way back to the village, then a horrifying scene plays. The calm of the village being broken by King Bulblin as he takes Colin. Link takes chase and knocks the king off the Great Harleian Bridge, saving a wounded Colin from the brink of capture. He drops off the injured child to Kakariko. After wrestling a Goron in one of the single coolest moments in Zelda history, he's granted entry into the Goron Mines. Of all of the 3D fire dungeons in the Zelda series, this is likely my favourite of the bunch, though some of the others such as the Fire Temple and the Fire Sanctuary come pretty darn close since I quite like all of them. Saying that, it doesn't rank that highly in my ranking of the dungeons in this game, probably coming in around middle of the pack. As most of the dungeons in this game do, it really feels like this has a place in the world, thanks in no small part to it being a mine. This is a place that would be in the real world. If the Gorons lived on Earth, then they would likely make these exact mines and would have machinery all over the place. The puzzle design being focused around traversal a lot of the time is really cool too. Some of the coolest puzzles in the game are the ones where you drop down and equip the iron boots because it just feels so good. My only gripe in this regard is how slow you walk, but heck, he's walking in iron boots, I shouldn't complain. While this mine is still pretty linear, I don't think it's quite as linear as the forest temple, though you're still finding people and that's the main drive for making your way through. As soon as you think the iron boots puzzle start to get a little stale though, the game throws its mini boss at you in the form of Dongoro, a Goron guard who's not completely clear on who you are and what you're doing in the mines. Upon almost killing the poor dude, he realises his mistake and lets you through to the next room. The room that houses the item of this dungeon, the hero's bow. Only a few puzzles use the bow but it's still a nice inclusion and it felt great getting the bow really early on for once. Something we're not really that used to in Zelda games for some reason. The enemy variety in this dungeon is also great. A ton of fire based creatures, it's a shame about the Dodongo design but let's move on before other Zelda tubers start being sad about that design too. <laughs> After a really great dungeon we move on to the boss. Set in a giant room, you're poised to fight Fyrus. It's the only boss in the game to have only one phase, but it's still pretty fun. Grab his chains, pull him down, rinse and repeat. It feels much more like a boss from Shadow of the Colossus or something like that, but it is fun. With that, the few shadow is taken off of Phyrus, whose form changes, revealing him to actually be Darbus, the Goron Patriarch, someone who'd been missing for a little while now. With this, Link cured the relationship between the Hylians and the Gorons, and he picks up his second piece of the few shadow. Overall, I'd say this dungeon gets around about the right amount of praise. It's nothing mind-blowing, but it's a fun romp and I find myself wanting to come back to it pretty darn often. Okay, a lot happens in this section, so I'm just going to condense it a whole lot. Link's then directed to go down to Lake Hylia, an area to the west of Castletown in the Wii U version of the game. Then you're treated to doing the final one of the three most annoying Wolf Link sections of the game. To me, this is probably the most tedious since it can involve you doing a lot of backtracking, but that could just be a skill issue on my end since I'm not as good at finding the ones in this area. Thank the lord I don't have to bring these sections up again though, because I really do dislike them personally. They're a cool way of showcasing the area before you get to properly explore it, but it's not necessary. After this, we're then treated to a horrifying clip, giving us more context to the world of Hyrule. It does a good job of that, showing us how the interlopers became the twilight and giving us a much more symbolic way of showing things rather than outright telling us everything. Something that fits the lore of something happening countless years ago. After gaining news that the Zora Queen's son and so the heir to the Zora is injured from the soul of the queen herself, Link sets off to Castletown, where the child supposedly is lying waiting for help. As Link opens the door to Telma's bar, he likely didn't expect what was on the other side. A professor stating that the Zora anatomy isn't his specialty, followed by a childhood friend in Ilya walking around the bar. Stunned, Link walks around seemingly asking for answers. Telma tells him that she's lost her memory and would fit in with the kids at Kakariko Village, since they're all from Ordon Village, but that she needs an escort and the Hylian Knights aren't man enough for the task, further emphasised through their actions. 
Now I love this cutscene. It shows us how much courage this incarnation of the hero has, better than most of the cutscenes in this game or in the series, since he accepts without a second thought. After a troubling ride to Kakariko Village, which I don't really have much to say about, since it is just a protect the carriage mission, it's, it's okay I guess. After some heartfelt character moments between characters such as Renardo and Telma, along with Link and Colin, Link sees a vision of the Zora Queen telling him where to find something that will aid him on his journey ahead. She leads him to King Zora's grave and leaves some tear-jerking words for Link to leave to her son. And again, I just love the world building. The Zelda team could have got away with less, but they didn't, and they put the effort into their different characters and races in this game. With that, she leaves Link with Zora armor and a newfound sense of determination. He stops off at the bomb shop in Kakariko to get some water bombs and head back to Lake Hylia. Lake Hylia is really cool in this game, possibly the coolest we've ever seen for the location in the series if you count all of the stuff under the water. After everything he's been through, it's time to take the final piece of the Fused Shadow. He blows a hole to the entrance of the temple, and so begins, Lake Bed Temple. Hands down my favourite water dungeon in the 3D set of games, and almost no doubt in my mind the best water dungeon in the series in my opinion. Unsettling music roams free, and Link is all the way underwater with no real backup apart from Midna. For some people, this could be the scariest dungeon in the series, just down to this basically being a giant underwater cave on the bottom of a lake, especially since a ton of this dungeon is set underwater too. This game truly has the best underwater exploration of any other Zelda game in my opinion. Skyward Sword has better options for underwater traversal, but these areas are just so great. I personally rank this dungeon just a little above the Gora Mines, but not by much. It's still around that middle section. Enemy variety is fantastic as usual, all of these foes are crafted really well for the environment and that enhances the dungeon. This temple also reuses the idea of water level, but does it better than previous versions in my opinion, with the water slide that can take Link down anytime he wants whenever he changes the flow of water. These puzzles are more complicated than the others so far in my experience, and I just have more fun with these puzzles in general. So I'm speaking very highly of this temple, so what brings it down? Both the mini boss and the boss are pretty forgettable, or just not fun. The item is really cool though, as you'd expect since it is the first of two claw shots, though it's still not overly fun, if I'm honest. So yeah, I love the traversal and puzzles in this dungeon. Seriously, I love being underwater in games, and this game does it perfectly. I've never had such a cool balance of fear and tension than I had through underwater parts of this temple. Though, some sections just let it down a little bit, with the backtracking if you end up doing something wrong, plus Morpheal is just a really simple boss that isn't really that fun apart from the epicness factor, which is a big one. But after a pretty darn good dungeon, Link collects his third and final fused shadow, and Midna opens up a portal to leave, feeling fantastic and ready to use the shadow on the usurper King Zant. They both teleport to the same place that the Light Spirit had talked to them just a couple of real hours ago. Feeling proud that he's finally accomplished his mission, Link smiles, turns around, and can feel success just around the corner. The whole of Hyrule saved. There wasn't much to do now, just get to the Mirror of Twilight and take the fight to the King himself. As Link turns around, a horror sweeps his face, as a familiar black cloak lay in front of him. Link standing head to head with the Usurper King himself, Zant. Thank you so much for watching this video, if you enjoyed then please do support me by leaving a like rating and subscribing, you won't miss the third episode of this big retrospective, and you'll join the 20% of people who are subscribed. You'll also get even more content, so thank you a ton if you do. The people you can see on screen right now are my Patreon supporters, and thank you all so much for the support guys, some G and Jared Whedon are especially amazing for being my top paying patrons, now just look at the Triforce coloured names and that Triforce font. Thank you so, so much for the support. If you'd like to join them, then you can do for as little as £1 or $1.58 a month. The link to my Patreon is in the description, and along with that link is a link to the rest of my media platforms, so follow me on them to keep in touch with me. Again, thank you so much for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll likely see you on Sunday. But for now, please do stay safe.